Hello, this is Cheryl Ayat, author of Thinking and Playing Music, Op Intentional <laughs> Strategies for Optimal Practice and Performance. Today I'm going to talk about the fugue process. Um, learning these pieces can be quite daunting, so if we understand um, the process of, of the subject's answers, the, the I don't really like to call it a form, but it does give us some structure for learning and for memory, so I'm going to talk about that today. So we're going to start just with the, the basic components of a fugue. So a fugue will always begin with a subject in a single voice. In this case, this is in the alto. This is from the C major fugue from Well-Tempered Clavier Book One. And in this case, it is then um, immediately followed by a real answer. So the subject statement will also always be followed by an answer at the fifth. If it's, it's a real answer, it is when it is intervallically identical to the subject. So you'll notice every interval is preserved. And what will happen next is another statement of the subject. We'll follow that whole form through in just a moment. And we also often have, instead of a real answer, a tonal answer. And this will often happen when the subject is either very, um, stressful of the dominant or moving towards the dominant at the at the end. So here we have the subject. And you'll notice the answer starts on the fifth as we would expect, but then because it's starting on the fifth, we're going to go up a fourth instead of a perfect fifth and then a third. And now we've regained our contour. So that is what we would call a tonal answer. Um, subjects are also often paired with counter subjects. So this is from the B flat major fugue from book one. So initially we have the subject in its first voice. The subject will then be answered in a different voice and then Bach writes a count, this first counter subject, which will appear in partnership with the subject throughout the fugue. As we continue in this fugue, there will be a second subject statement, um, the counter subject, first counter subject in a different voice, and the addition of counter subject two. So when we put that all together, we have subject in the soprano. Now we move to the answer in the alto, paired with the first counter subject in the soprano. And notice this is a, a tonal answer because we start with a third, and a thirds and a fifth instead of steps and a fourth. So answer, first counter, subject. Now we move to the subject in the bass, the first counter subject in the alto, and the second counter subject is now joined in the soprano. technically a three voice fugue, but Bach will occasionally do this. This should be the end of what we call the exposition, but Bach in this case adds a second answer now in the soprano to kind of imitate the form of a four voice fugue. Uh, one of the things I like to do with students um, with, with fugues is we do some score study before they start to practice it. So we might highlight the subjects in one color, the counter subjects in a second color, or if there are two counter subjects in two different colors. Um, sometimes I also use a colored pencil and we circle something, if something's derivative. So this subject tail, this comes from the subject tail here. Um, this comes from the counter subject tail. So we can mark that up. This is always in a copy. We don't ever do this in the score that they're going to practice from. We can also make another copy and we highlight according to voice, and this is particularly helpful 
for the student or the learner to track through um, an alto voice that's crossing uh, staffs, staves, because this can be quite difficult to keep track of. It also helps um, notice where the rests are, which can be really important in, in learning. Um, we also, in the, at what we call the exposition, often have links between the answer and the second subject. So this is from the C minor fugue in book one. So here we have the subject. And then the answer in the soprano. Now we have subject-like material. subject in the base. So that is what we would call a link. Um, codettas are similar to links but are used to um, punctuate material. So this is at from the end of the D minor. Uh, we have our cadence. that cadence in a little codetta. Um, I'm going to go back. So here's another example of some of the things that might happen in, in a fugue. And this is why we really call it a process rather than a form, because the possibilities really are endless. And Bach, being the genius that he is, is going to make use of all of those. So in this first fugue from book one, C major, we have the subject. have the answer in the soprano. And then this is what we would call a link, but he links us by using another answer, this time in the tenor. What should happen, we should have subject, answer, subject, answer in a four voice fugue. So there we had an extra answer. Now we have the subject in the bass. in the tenor, but we also had an extra subject statement in the soprano, so we have this bit of a stretto. So when we put all this together, answer, now here's the extra answer as a link. in the bass. The extra subject statement in the soprano. And here's the answer. So it's very entangled, as you can see. And um, so understanding how that process works is really helpful. One of the things I also often have students do is they rewrite their fugue, but they only write out the subject statements, um, and then they practice and memorize from that, which can be very helpful. Um, here's a really good example of stretto. This is from, again, from the D sharp major fugue, sorry, D sharp minor. And because this is a little bit more tangling, I'm actually using a recording from Angela Hewitt. So stretto is when we have subject statements or answer statements in close overlap. So the arrows are showing the beginning of each statement. Here we have it in inversion. Um, here is in, in its true form. And I believe this starts right where the arrows are. I'm going to stop share for just a second and start again and make sure I'm sharing sound. So let me do that again in case that wasn't sharing sound.
sorry, <laughs> trying to advance. Um, so some other contra contrapuntal treatments that you will find in fugues, there is inversion. So we'll notice that in the strato section we had, we had this, now it's upside down. Uh, we will also have contrapuntal treatments such as augmentation, so this, becomes so again this is an example of box genius how he will use all of those simultaneously um, we also can have diminution this happens less often so this is from the art of the fugue so what we do is we take our note values and they're moving faster instead of slower so this So here is this example I was talking about where we have many of these contrapuntal treatments simultaneously. So we have a subject in the alto voice, it's marked in blue. We have the subject in augmentation, it's marked in purple. And we have the subject in inversion, it's marked in green. And again, this is Angela Hewitt. actually play that one more time so the recording starts right here at this subject statement I'll do it once more And that ends my presentation on Fugue Process. I hope you found this helpful. Thank you so much and have a great day.